Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the fourth of five talks about non-duality. Today we'll look at how we often feel separate from the earth and the world of nature. We'll see how a little biology can remind us of the many ways in which we carry the earth inside of us. And through meditation, we can begin to recover our essential wholeness with the earth. Let's begin. If we lived with an ongoing appreciation of how our bodies and the earth are not separate, there isn't a true duality between them. If we lived that way, our bodies would feel rather transparent. We would understand in a very visceral sense how air and food and energy and water move in and out of the body on a daily basis. We would understand that the earth is our home. It gave us birth. It provides what we need during life and it's where we return when our individual lives end. But the modern world makes it hard to keep those facts in mind. It sets up a sense of separation where there's a world outside and then there's the inside experience of the individual. And these seem to be separate and divided by some kind of barrier. The reasons for this are in some cases clear. We live in buildings that are climate controlled and shield us from nature. We travel in vehicles that move very rapidly over the surface of the earth, but also isolate it from us. And there are many technologies that keep us protected from the weather and other aspects of the environment that would make us uncomfortable or even threaten us. This is all an advantage. Modern life has many advantages, but it does lead to a strong sense of separation. In addition, there is the inner textured experience of each individual that feels very personal and intimate. So I have my inner sensations and my urges and my emotions and the images I carry uh, in my mind and the thoughts. And these seem very compelling to me. And I can talk about them, but I cannot share them with others directly. And so this contributes to the sense that there is an inner experience that is cut off from the experience outside. And yet there are a lot of ways in which the outside world comes in. There's the water we drink and bathe with that comes to us through some kind of distribution system, but is ultimately sourced from a stream or a lake or an aquifer. And so we drink the liquids of the earth, the waters of the earth, and they become part of our bodies, part of what we think of as inside. There's the food we eat that is grown from the earth. And we may not have much to do with its production and harvesting and so on, but we eat it regularly and it enters the body. And so in this sense too, the earth is not only outside, it's also inside. And for one other example, we can think of what happens to biological tissue when life is disrupted. So when we die, our bodies will soften and decay and the matter in them will return to the earth. And so in this sense too, we carry within us the earth. That is to say, everything that's in our bodies right now will eventually return to the earth and is thus part of it. So we can see with these very apparent facts that the idea that the earth is somehow separate from us, that we're cut off from it, is really an illusion. Because in the most basic material terms, it's inside of us. There's another sense, though, in which the earth isn't outside, but is in fact in our direct personal experience. And that's what our sense organs bring to us. So we have sight and hearing and touch and taste and smell, and these all connect with the earth and help us build up an experience of it in our nervous system. In effect, the senses grab hold of what's going on out there and bring it inside into our consciousness. Thus, that idea that the outside is somehow cut off from us is really very illusory. We can take these facts and expand on them a bit and then contemplate and meditate in ways that will restore our sense of essential wholeness with the earth. To do that, we'll begin by looking at vision, which 
clearly has a lot to do with how we understand and experience the world, at least in sighted individuals. So we know the eye is connected to our nervous system, and a big part of the nervous system is the brain, and the brain has a lot to do with our experience of sight. It's connected very directly to the eyes. There's a nerve that connects the eyes to the substance of the brain, and there are fiber tracks which travel through the brain. And so the eyes up front bring in the visual information. They form images, much like cameras do, and then that information in the images is transmitted to the back of the brain where the visual part of it resides, that is to say, the visual cortex. So if we look out upon the world and see, for instance, a mountain, what happens is the light rays enter the eye and the retinas in the eye begin to process the visual information. It then sends that information back through the substance of the brain after going through the optic nerve. And an inner experience of that self-same mountain is developed in our consciousness. And so there's an inner representation of the mountain outside. And we think we're seeing the mountain outside, but what we're really seeing on a day-to-day -day basis is our inner experience of it brought to us courtesy of this very complex and beautiful biology. The process of building up an inner image of something outside is similar to what animators do when they create animated movies. So they might take a picture of a mountain and begin by sketching out a rough picture of it in the computer software. And then they might add features like snow packs and vegetation, and they would eventually build up a rather convincing visual scene. And so we can go to a movie and perhaps even a 3D movie. We wear the right types of glasses and we see what looks very much like an actual terrain in front of us. Thanks to all that technology, all those skilled animators. But it's important to keep in mind how much goes into developing a computer generated image, particularly one in three dimensions, particularly one that changes like a movie. Huge numbers of professional animators work on the project and a lot of very powerful computers contribute to the final product. It's impressive to be sure, but if we compare that to what's going on in our bodies, it's somewhat less impressive because the little brain, much smaller than all those racks of computers, is capable of generating a three-dimensional experience of the world that we can actually move around in. We don't have to sit in one place and wear 3D glasses. We can get up and move into it. And we can hear events in that world and touch them and smell and taste them if we wish. All of this happens very quickly without a whole room full of computers, without hundreds of animators, and so on. It's an everyday and moment-by-moment -moment fact of our existence. Quite impressive, in my opinion. Now, sometimes the way that the nervous system builds up an inner representation of the world is compared to virtual reality technology. So we could say that we carry within our consciousness a virtual reality that somehow reflects what's going on in the world outside. I actually don't like that terminology. I like to think of it more as a kind of natural resonance. So there are countless resonant functions and processes in nature. One of them is the so-called Schumann phenomenon that I learned about when I was preparing this talk. Evidently, when lightning strikes the Earth, as it does frequently all around the planet, Electromagnetic wave patterns are set up in the atmosphere and in the ionosphere above the atmosphere. And these patterns resonate and form a kind of music of electromagnetic energy that fills that space hundreds of miles above the planet in a resonant and harmonious way. So nature has this way of resonating and harmonizing. And we can even look at the whole process of biological evolution the way the human species came from earlier species of hominid, from ape-like animals, from earlier primate species, from all the terrestrial 
uh, lineage of vertebrates and the lineage of organisms that were vertebrates in the sea and then earlier invertebrate organisms and so on. This was discussed in the last talk. But at every step as animals evolve, they're tuning themselves to the environment, in effect resonating with them. And what we experience today as a rich visual landscape is in effect a kind of resonance of the organism with the earth. And so a good meditation can be just appreciating how much we experience as our sense organs bring in information from the environment and develop this experience of three-dimensionality, of textured soundscapes, of very rich, tactile, olfactory and gustatory sensations. All of this courtesy of the resonant quality of biology as it tunes itself to the flow of life on Earth. I'll leave that for your individual practice and we'll move on and look a little more deeply at the visual system. So we have those eyes up front and the visual cortex in the back. And within the eyes is a thin layer of tissue called the retina. If we expand an eye and look at it, we can see that the retina lines the back of it. It's about the thickness of a tissue paper. And it's light sensitive so that when light comes in the eye and strikes the retina, it responds in electrochemical signals and transmits modified versions of those signals back to the brain. But a fair amount of visual processing actually occurs in the retina itself prior to anything connecting with the brain. And I'd like to look at that briefly. So here we've got the retina, we're seeing how light comes into it, and we're going to stretch it out and stretch it out further and look at it in a photo micrograph. So now we're looking at a microscopic view of the retina. The green layer is made up of the photoreceptors, the light sensitive cells of the eye. You've probably heard of these are uh, rods and cones. The layers shown below the photoreceptors in this image are signal processing layers. There are cells in there that begin the very elaborate process of developing an image experience out of a raw a pattern of light striking the retina. If we enlarge the retina, we can begin to see the individual cells and we can actually record from them. And a lab I worked in in graduate school did exactly that. It would record from individual retinal cells. By doing such recordings, we can begin to characterize individual cells in the retina and see how they're connected in a kind of circuit diagram with other cells. And I'd like to explain one of the basic findings that's been uh, well characterized now, but was a major advance in the time of its discovery. So here we're recording from one cell in the retina, one of those image processing cells. It happens to be called a bipolar cell. When the retina is in the dark, there's a little squiggle of activity. Nothing very remarkable is recorded inside the cell. It turns out the cell is connected to an array of photoreceptors that we can see here. And we've now illuminated that array with a diffuse light. And interestingly, diffuse light doesn't cause much change in the activity. There's still just kind of a basic squiggle without a lot of signal in the bipolar cell. The photoreceptors respond strongly. The bipolar cell does not. So the bipolar cell is connected to this array and it's organized so that if we shine a little spot of light in the center of the array, then we get a strong response. We get a sharp upward deflection in this instance. What's interesting is that we can turn the light off, go back to baseline, and then shine another spot of light, but this time in the periphery of the array. And then what we get is another strong response, but it's in the opposite direction. Before we had an upward deflection, now we have a downward. Repeating these experiments over and over builds up a picture of how the array is organized. And it turns out that the center of the array leads to a positive response uh, for this particular bipolar cell and the outside rim of the array leads to a negative response. So the center and the surround respond oppositely to spots of light. One causes a signal that goes up and the other causes a signal that goes down. Well, why would this be an advantage? It turns out it's very useful for working with situations where we need to have the ability to detect very subtle degrees of contrast. 
So this lioness hidden in some grass does not pop out immediately to the eye. I mean, maybe the facial features of the lion are fairly obvious, but we don't really see the creature very well. But if we look closely, we can make out its contour. And being able to make out that subtle contour is something that our retinas make possible for us because of this arrangement of having a center region that responds in the opposite way from the surround. This behavior is the result of how nerve cells interact with one another. So we're looking at two nerve cells here, also called neurons. The left half of each cell is what we might think of as the input side, and the right half is the output side. So a signal travels down the long stem of the nerve cell from the input to the output end. It can then jump to the next neuron, set up a new signal in that one, which continues. That process of jumping occurs at what we call synapses, which I'm sure everyone has heard of, and I'd like to briefly look at a synapse. So we enlarge and we look at a simple schematic of a synapse. And what we see are vesicles of neurotransmitter. So this could be serotonin or dopamine or endorphins, some of those famous neurotransmitters. There are many uh, possibilities. When the signal arrives at the output end of the neuron on the left, it stimulates the release of these neurotransmitters. The vesicles open out to the surface, the transmitters diffuse to the next cell in line, and they set up a signal in that one. Now this looks fairly simple in this picture, but it's actually highly complex. The synapse is a very sophisticated structure, a little bit like a microprocessor. It has a lot going on inside it, as this picture shows. There's a lot happening there, a lot of proteins, a lot of chemicals, and there's also a lot of movement. Now, cells communicate with each other outside of the nervous system. Here we're looking at two immune cells. The one on the left has eaten some kind of invading organism. It is what's called a macrophage, which is to say it's a large cell that eats other cells and it's transmitting information about what it's eaten to the little lymphocyte on the right so that the lymphocyte can go and mount an immune attack. So we just saw an instance of two cells communicating. Of course, life communicates all over the place. We could think of the pollen transfer from one flower to the next through the intermediary of a bumblebee as being another instance of life transmitting information from one form to the next. So two neurons in the brain are simply doing what life does in many cases all over the place. Now, of course, neurons in the retina or in the brain are not isolated. There are lots of them all around. And so here I've added a couple and each of them have an output end that feeds into the same input end of the neuron on the right. And it's actually the summation of all the signals coming from all the cells that is detected and leads to a propagating impulse down that cell on the right. And then, of course, the cell on the right connects with other neurons to the input ends of others. So we've got the output end connecting with three input ends on the right there. And signals can be sent to each of those. And if the signal is strong enough, impulses will be set up in those cells as well. And of course, we could keep going. There are cells to the left of the original cells we started with. There are also cells that form feedback loops that, so that the output end of one connects to the out, input end of a couple of other neurons and comes all the way back and connects with the input end of the original neuron, creating a loop. Now this kind of basic arrangement is sufficient to lead to the array that we saw before. In fact, though, this kind of simplistic setup isn't going to give us what we think of as human vision. It might allow us to pick out little spots of uh, bright and dark and color and so on, but it wouldn't really give us a very detailed picture of the environment. It certainly wouldn't allow us to detect a lioness hiding in the grass. That requires more neural tissue. It requires, in other words, the brain and that visual cortex that we've talked about. Now, the visual cortex has layers upon layers of millions upon millions 
and even billions of nerve cells, all of them sending impulses, all of them interacting, and in ways that are only partially understood, developing a visual image. The idea that many cells can interact in a productive way is, I think, well understood. Here we're looking at heart cells. These can be grown in isolation until they expand and connect with one another. And when they do, they begin to throb or beat in unison. And so this is an example of the collective work of many cells, in this case, forming a contraction in a heart muscle, obviously very important to life. The collective action of nerve cells is in some sense similar although far more complicated. I like to think of what's going on in our nervous system and indeed in the whole body as being rather like a garden. It's a garden of life that we experience moment by moment as we see and hear and touch the world. The world is brought into our bodies where we experience it directly as a sensory experience. So that when we look upon a three-dimensional scene or even walk through it, there's a sense in which the garden inside our nervous system and indeed the garden inside our whole bodies is producing this experience for us. And we think that we're looking at something outside of our organism, but in fact, we are really seeing the activity of our own cells that are resonating with whatever is actually out there by virtue of light rays and sound rate waves and so on. But what we see is the activity of our own cells, again, in resonance with the mountains outside. And so the mountains that we're looking at as we move through them, in a sense, are part of our own body. By that, I mean that what we are seeing, again, is our own cellular activity. Yes, of course, there's a mountain that's actually out there and we can learn a lot about it from our visual images, but the images themselves are biological and internal to our organism. For me, this is a very profound and, I would say, spiritual fact. And so life is built from this internalization, this inner resonance of the organism with everything that's out in what we call the larger world. And so when we think about our bodies and how they have that rich and textured sensory and mental experience, the emotions and the urges and every other thing going on inside there that feels so close and personal. We could think of that inner experience as being our own inner garden of life that is resonating moment by moment with the world outside. And it has within it, of course, the waters of the earth. And it has the earth itself in the form of the solid stuff we call food. And it has as a potential its eventual and inevitable return to the earth. All of its matter will return to the planet. And so the earth is inside of us, not just in those material terms, but of course, again, by virtue of our sensory systems, but likewise, bring the earth within. And so the idea that there is an outside and inside begins to fall apart. There is just an experience of life. and our bodies are inherently and holistically a part of the earth, and our experience is not of an earth outside and a body inside, it's of a body in resonance with a living planet, with the biosphere. I'd like to highlight from time to time how there is still some mystery in all of this. We can't claim that because we understand certain facts about how eyes work or how neurons work that we understand everything about reality, about life on Earth. There is mystery, there is beauty, and I would even say there is love. As we get in touch with this essential wholeness, this non-duality, we are in a good position to meditate in a way that will reconnect us with the living world. You can keep your eyes open. If there's a window or a picture nearby, look toward that. Feel the support of the earth below. 
how it supports your sitting bones and your thighs. Perhaps your feet are on the floor. Perhaps your back is resting against a chair. But you're in contact with the earth. It is holding your body and you can feel that stability. So the earth is near. And the mass of your body, the substance of it that the furniture and the earth hold, that comes from the earth and will eventually return to the biosphere. So you can feel the substance of your body as part of this planet. And then look at that window or that picture And you may think that that's a picture on the other side of a room or it's a visual scene outside a window. And of course there is something on the wall or there is something outside the window. But what you are actually experiencing is your own cellular resonance. So the light that reflects off the picture or off the landscape outside enters your eyes strokes the retina with patterns of light. The retina responds, sends electrochemical signals to the brain, and somehow this becomes your visual experience. You're looking at the activity of your own cells every time you open your eyes. And we could go further and say how oh, you may think you're hearing my voice and that it's coming from some kind of computer or phone. And that's true. But what you actually experience is your own brain resonating with the sound waves in the environment which happen to have been generated initially by my voice. You're living in this garden of cellular activity that is a body that provides you with sights and sounds, feelings of touch, taste, smell, the sensations in a body, the mental and emotional experiences all of it a garden, a garden of living process, layered and communicating, resonating with the world. And so what you see outside is your own nervous system as it brings you this picture of the outside world to help you survive and thrive and perhaps to experience feelings of love and support, awe and wonder, and to reconnect you with the essential wholeness that is your life on this beautiful planet Earth. <laughs>